On this edition of the Newsmakers, we ask what's behind the recent upsurge in violence in Kashmir and what it would take to bring peace to the region. Also on today's program, Saudi women join forces online to demand an end to the guardianship system that means men control their lives. And in picture this, we look back at the life of Shimon Perez, a defining figure of Israeli politics who's died at the age of 93. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. The dispute between India and Pakistan over Kashmir has been uh, ongoing since the time of partition. But a recent upsurge in violence has been one of the worst for several years. The situation is immensely complex, involving many different groups with competing aims and claims and deep historical grievances. Our Newsmaker today is Kashmir as we ask what's behind the recent unrest and we also ask what it will take to end the decades-long cycle of violence. In Srinagar, the streets are a stage for clashes. Indian forces and protesters have been fighting each other with stones, pellets and tear gas. And the consequences have been deadly. At least 80 people have died since July. This fresh round of bloodshed began when 22-year-old rebel leader Burhan Wani was killed by security forces. The Indian government considered him a terrorist, but to his supporters, he was a freedom fighter. The clashes have led to curfews in towns and cities across the region. But it hasn't stopped the violence. This month, 18 soldiers were killed in the deadliest attack on forces in Kashmir in nearly two decades. No one has claimed responsibility. But while the cycle of unrest continues, it's the ordinary people of Kashmir who are paying the price, while everyday life has been put on hold. Kashmir's tensions go back to the partition of Pakistan and India when the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir was carved up between the two nations. Some territory in the north came under the control of China. The area remaining under Indian control comprises three regions. Jammu, which is Hindu majority, the Kashmir Valley, which is Muslim majority, and the sparsely populated Ladakh, which is a mix of Muslims, Buddhists and Hindus. In 1948, the UN Security Council passed a resolution saying the people of Kashmir should decide which country they join, that the question of the accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India or Pakistan should be decided through the democratic method of a free and impartial plebiscite. But there were conditions attached and the promised referendum never happened. And the heavily patrolled line of control has served as a de facto border ever since. With neither side willing to let go of its interests and other groups calling for an independent state, the waiting game has been bloody on all sides. But will this latest round of clashes do anything to change the status quo? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, we're going to get deeper into the debate on the issues in just a moment, but for the latest on the situation on the ground, I'm joined from Srinagar by journalist Parvez Bukhari. Parvez, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, tell me what it's like right now on the ground in Kashmir. Uh, see, it's been uh, more than uh, two months, two and a half months, that the place is under a lockdown. We witnessed a series of communication blockouts in between newspapers were also banned for a few days. Shops, schools, banks, all business establishments, everything is on hold. People are protesting. People are protesting against Indian rule. Like your uh, news story said, they're demanding uh, they be asked what, the, what, what, what should their future be. Uh, the fact of the matter is that underneath in Kashmir all the time, even when you have quote-unquote peaceful periods, there is a firmament of anti-India sentiment that is growing all the time. And it's always, always, you know, ready to burst waiting for a trigger. That's precisely what happened July 8th when uh, a popular young rebel leader was killed in a gunfight with government forces. And ever since then, 
it's been it's been protests and clashes and a heavy heavy security crackdown on the population in Kashmir. <laughs> We've seen long curfews, perhaps longest in the last 26 years ever since an armed rebellion in the uh, in, in 1990s erupted here. Um, so, uh, and this time around, although we've seen cycles uh, after cycles of protestations, if you see from 1990, then we saw the huge public mobilizations, unarmed protests by hundreds of thousands of Kashmiri people in 2008 and then 2010, and there was again a period of calm, and this year it erupted again. But the problem has been that. Uh, the Indian state has been enhancing security measures to put the public protestation down. There have been very little or no political measures to address the fundamental political dispute over Kashmir, right. and that's precisely what Kashmiri people are asking for. Pervez, thank you so much for that update. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the not-too-distant future. Pervez Bukhari joining us there from Kashmir. Now let's broaden out this debate. Joining me now from New Delhi is uh, Deputy Resident Editor of the Hindu newspaper, Suhasni Haider. And from London, I'm joined by Muzamil Ayub Thakur. He's the President of the Kashmir Institute of International Affairs. Thanks both of you for joining us. Suhasni Haider, let, let me start with you. Uh, it's a bad situation on the ground. More than 80 people killed, thousands wounded. Those, those pellets are causing horrible injuries um, on the ground. We're seeing particularly very young people are getting hurt by them. Um, are Indian forces being reckless and trigger happy, or is the deadly use of force at the moment in Kashmir justified? Well, you know, just to start with, uh, I do want to make the point that you're asking a journalist uh, as uh, uh, from India as opposed to somebody who represents the sure. government or the security forces. I, I do want to make that clear. Absolutely. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, in Kashmir, particularly given the kind of interest that is, given the kind of uh, interest that is from India, from uh, international uh, media agencies as well, uh, there is a tendency to look very, very closely at what is going on. But what we do know is that there is at the same time uh, an internal protest, and Parvez spoke about that, that there are people who are very angry uh, with uh, the government and how the security forces have behaved over there. And at the same time, there is a, uh, there is a very tense border uh, with Pakistan on one side, a uh, slightly less tense border with China on the other in that very state. And at the same time, there is what India calls cross-border terror, militants who are able to infiltrate from Pakistan and come into Jammu and Kashmir and carry out attacks there. Sure. I'm not making up these figures. No, there absolutely. have been 23 such attacks sure. on security so has forces. It, uh, but I just want to separate it out for a second. Just for a second. So let's put exactly. India. So sure, let's just park off India and, and, and Pakistan. Separate. Sure, let's, let's park off India and Pakistan and their tensions for the moment. And let's just go very specifically then to the protests. And yes, they might be rock throwing, for example, from many young people. Uh, I go back to my question again. Is the is the deadly use of force by the Indian Army and the security forces there on the ground, is that justified? Well, justified is, again, it's a, it's a sort of uh, um, a value judgment. I definitely think it's excessive. I definitely think that security forces should not be uh, uh, even using guns, um, because in other parts of uh, the country we have seen security forces taking on large mobs that are very angry and using only a stick. Uh, perhaps, and tear gas alone. Uh, we are told, though, that the situation uh, warranted more force. Uh, even so, the fact that pellet guns were used at such short uh, distance from those protesters seems to have affected horrific injuries uh, there in Kashmir and on those protesters. Uh, we're looking at figures, uh, you know, upwards of 80 who have been killed because of, because of those. Um, so, I, so the short answer to your question is I, I can't say justified or not because that only the security forces on the ground uh, can really say properly. But it certainly from uh, a Delhi perspective seems excessive. Okay, Muzammil Ayub uh, Tokur, to what extent have things changed on the ground in Kashmir since the killing of that popular rebel commander that uh, Parvez Bukhari mentioned, Burhan Wani, in July. And how does this situation right now, from in your opinion, compare to previous tensions, particularly when we look back to 2008 and so on? Well, it's interesting. I was in uh, Kashmir in 2008 as well as 2010 and then again in 2014 when we had the floods and then again after uh, Burhan Wani was martyred. 
in each case, it has been exactly the same thing when it comes to the state oppression against the people. And that is using extremely high handedness against uh, the civilian population. We're talking about a curfew of 82 days where electricity has been banned in certain areas, water banned, food banned, medicine banned. People are unable to get food, people are unable to go to the hospitals. The ambulances are beaten and thrashed badly where they can no longer be used and even the attendants that are, that are with the patients in the ambulances are also beaten and some are even killed. So these are the, these are the current situations in Kashmir where you can not, not only are you being martyred, not only are you being killed by the so-called security forces, but then you are unable to take them to, for example, the hospital or even to the graveyard to be buried. We are unable to bury our own dead. We have had to do it in the middle of the night. We cannot travel. We cannot purchase food. There is no money in Kashmir at the moment. I mean, and, and it's, it's right now, it is a humanitarian disaster. I mean, when we talk about um, uh, the Gaza siege or the blockades, this is exactly what's happening mm -hmm. in Kashmir for the last 82 days. M uh, so Hasni mentioned the tensions with Pakistan, particularly, you know, they've been ratcheted up after the Uri attack uh, in, in Kashmir, which left 17 Indian soldiers dead. The Indian government pins the blame on Pakistan because it says it was committed by a group that is harbored or, or you know, given refuge within Pakistan, and they claim that the Pakistanis are backing this group. Let me ask you a, a very direct question then, Muzammil. Do you believe that Pakistan helps or hinders the cause of the Kashmiris in the valley who are protesting? Well, let me ask you another question. Has anybody actually heard what the Kashmiris are actually asking for? I mean, we are seeing people on the streets in the millions protesting with flags, with banners, with statements, with stones. Young children as young as four years old have been uh, pellet ridden from their head to their toe. So clearly we are in a position to dictate terms to the world about what we want. Where Pakistan comes into this or India comes into this is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that we are one of the longest standing issues on the United Nations agenda. It is, there have been resolution, resolutions passed in the United Nations where even India have been present and it was India that took the issue to the United Nations. So what I'm saying is that the issue of Kashmir is in the hands of the Kashmiris, is in the hands of the population. There is nobody that can dictate the terms to us and there is nobody that can hinder us as long as mm -hmm. we are unified and we are unified and we have been unified since the day that we were occupied. Yeah. Now my point, sure. my fundamental point is that we have been asking for the right to decide we have been asking for the basic rights of humans, right. democracy. We have been asking for freedoms. We have been asking for liberties, things that the entire West holds very dear to them. We're not asking for anything more, anything less than anybody else has. Okay, so Hasni wants to come in. So Hasni? No, I, I just want, you know, this continuous uh, reference to the UN and to the demands of the Kashmiri people for uh, independence, uh, you know, I, I understand the human tragedy aspect of it, but even the story that your uh, reporter put out there shows the 1948 resolution and referred to the fact that Kashmiris uh, should be asked whether they want to go to India or to Pakistan. Now, firstly, that was 70 years ago, so I don't know whether we can still continue to work on that basis. 70 years later, given that the ground position has changed as much as it can, it has. Secondly, if your reporter had done a little more research, she would have seen that that resolution also calls for Pakistan first to uh, vacate its uh, the portion of Kashmir that its uh, sure. troops hold. There today. were there were there uh, were conditions to that resolution. Sure, and, and okay, before fair we enough. get to that situation. So the enough. choice has always been India or Pakistan. The idea of independence is not there in the UN resolution. And, and you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm sorry to sound heartless about it, but it is not an option. Well, no, well, uh, well hold on. Given that Kashmir is a, is oh, a landlocked... Hold on, I, th uh, I think there is a nuanced way, Suhasni. I mean, there was a UN Security Council resolution 47 of 1948, August 1948. Yes, it did say that the Kashmiris have the right to choose. You're absolutely right that some of the conditions uh, involved Pakistan vacating their third of, of Kashmir or, or their part of uh, Kashmir. Let me pose that to Muzammil. Muzammil, when an Indian says that that referendum can't happen because it was 70 years ago and also because of subsequent wars and agreements between India and Pakistan, that makes that referendum or the potential for that referendum and the very existence of that ref uh, um, uh, that potential referendum and that UN Security Council yes, resolution, it makes it, it makes it moot. Muzammil, how do you respond to that? 
if it makes it moot, then India should go back to the United Nations and, and uh, suggest the third option of independence. If that is the argument, then, mm -hmm. go, then so be it. Let them have the third the option of independence. But the fact Pakistan of the matter is the same thing. Independence it doesn't matter. Well. Please, Ms. Haider, please, allow me to... I gave you the respect to speak. Allow me the respect to speak. The fact of the matter is there are human rights, gross human rights violations. India is part of the United Nations and wish to be part of the United Nations Security Council. How can they be part of the United Nations Security Council when there are gross, mass human rights violations? To the extent that I would say there are war crimes happening in Kashmir. There are severe war crimes happening in Kashmir. So regardless of India and Pakistan, the United Nations, if you don't want to use that argument, fine, so be it. But at least allow a referendum, a plebiscite to happen in Kashmir and allow the, uh, the, the population to decide what they want. If you say that the UN resolutions are defunct, then to that extent, allow the Indian government to allow a third option into a plebiscite. At least have the plebiscite. Even if you are negating the United Nations, have the plebiscite. So, Hasni? It's very simple. You're, you're changing the goalpost. If you are referring to the United Nations, then according to that resolution, Pakistan must vacate its territory or the territory that it occupies of Kashmir before we can Why get into any... Why are you obsessed with Pakistan? Referendum. Please deal with your own I'm troubles you and your own problems first. Resolution. Leave Pakistan aside. What is in the UN resolution? If you want to speak ab initio about a freedom movement inside Kashmir, then, you know, that has to then be uh, recorded alongside many other uh, um, freedom movements around the world that haven't uh, uh, yet gone anywhere. I, I could refer uh, to the Kurdish problem there in Turkey as well. Uh, the, the fact is that if you want to go back to the UN resolution, then you've got to follow the first tenet of that UN resolution. If you don't think that first tenet is possible... Yes, demilitarization. Why don't you, you begin the demilitarization yourself, then? It is, why don't you read the UN resolution? It says Pakistan has to do it first, and India has to satisfy itself that Pakistan has vacated that portion of... Take the of initiative. Kashmir. Take okay. the initiative. Okay, I, have, I apologize. We are out of time. I've got to wrap. So, Hasni and Muzamil, thank you very much for joining us. Still to come on the Newsmakers, we speak to a prominent Saudi women's rights activist about a campaign to end the controversial male guardianship system. And in picture this, we look at the life and career of Israel's Shimon Peres. Saudi Arabia is one of the most restrictive countries in the world for women. They're not allowed to drive and need the permission of a so-called male guardian to engage in many basic activities. One young woman told Human Rights Watch the guardianship system leaves women living in a box drawn for them by their fathers or husbands. But now thousands have joined forces online to push for change, as Christine Pirovalakis reports. Saudi women are taking a stand. More than 15,000 of them have now signed an online petition, the first of its kind, calling for the government to end the country's guardianship system. Under Saudi law, all women must have the consent of a male relative to carry out some of life's most basic tasks. They need permission to travel abroad, marry, or to open a bank account. In some cases, they also need permission to work or to access health care. Male guardians are usually the woman's father or husband, but can also be a brother, even a son. The system means that in the view of the Saudi state, from birth until death, women are permanent legal minors. And a growing number say that needs to change. Saudi Arabia is one of the richest countries in the world. It's also one of the most conservative. Its human rights record, especially concerning women, has often been called into question. Saudi Arabia is the only nation in the world where women are banned from driving, a situation this Saudi comedian satirized in a viral video. No, I'm not dry. No, I'm not dry. Female activists who were fed up with the situation started the Women to Drive campaign in 2008. The government is taking some steps to loosen the restrictions on women. It's passed reforms making it easier for women to work and has appointed women to the king's advisory board. And for the first time in history, 
women were allowed to vote and to run for office in municipal elections last year. The push for more women's rights comes at a time of broader change in Saudi Arabia. The young deputy crown prince Mohammed bin Salman is leading a drive to reform the economy and to wean the economy off its addiction to oil. His plan calls for more women to be involved in the workforce. Only 18% of Saudi women have jobs, even though more women than men graduate from university. The plunge in oil prices has put huge pressure on government budgets as more people point to the economic cost of keeping such tight restrictions on half its population. Could financial pressure finally be the catalyst to bring change for Saudi women? Christine Pirovolakis, The Newsmakers. Hala Dasri joins me now from Washington, D.C. She's a Saudi women's rights activist who's been involved in the online campaign against the guardianship system. Hala, good to talk to you once again. So there is this online petition. There's a call from thousands of Saudi women, including yourself. Do you think King Salman will listen? Well, we wish that he would listen, uh, particularly within the light, within light of the um, economic uh, burden uh, that the country is being, you know, experiencing since the last uh, two years, um, and with the with the pressure of um, so many educated women who are now trying to join the workforce. Um, and, you know, find it very restrictive because of the several restrictions on their mobility or because of the guardianship permission um, requirements. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is not a bastion of democracy or freedom or human rights by any measure for, for women and, and for men in general. Are we seeing, however, as a Saudi, looking at the big picture, are we seeing small signs, however small, that things might just be opening up? There are small signs, yes, um, and I think it, they are triggered not necessarily by um, response of the political leadership to uh, demands of uh, the public, more so by um, economic diversification and the national transformation um, plan, which is basically economic, um, you know, plan in, in heart, not necessarily um, circled around empowering uh, citizens. Uh, but those are ignoring the main important issues that restrict women's engagement. Um, such as the ability of women to commute, to travel, to seek uh, better education and training, um, to uh, you know uh, find some kind of legal um, redress when they have a problem. Uh, all those issues uh, involve um, you know several degrees of uh, restrictions because of mainly because of the guardianship. So the root causes of um, limitations on women's autonomy and agency uh, remain um, intact basically. Mm -hmm. And even when the government tries to remove, um, you know, the guardianship permission from the law, such as um, the labor law, for instance, they do not punish uh, employers, so they do not enforce uh, this type of, you know, uh, policy. Uh, and they allow people, basically, the employers, to seek uh, guardian permission as they wish. So, uh, in effect, rendering those uh, laws uh, really uh, ineffective in empowering women. If it does get removed, if those laws do get removed, uh, how much resistance can we expect from, from other members of society within Saudi Arabia who are, are deeply committed to a, a Salafi Wahhabi notion of a woman's role in society? Is there likely to be a lot of pushback? Of course not. This is um, an absolute monarchy. And this is something that um, the political leadership has been promoted a lot uh, as an excuse not to enact effective changes. But you've seen, uh, with the amount of restrictions that women live under, uh, more than uh, half of the university graduates are women. More than the people, more than half of the um, you know graduates in scholarship programs are women. Uh, so those families that really support their women to be part of the you know um, scholarship abroad or part of the educational system, uh, the applicants, for instance, for unemployment benefit, 85% of those applicants were women um, below 35 years of age. Um, so these are all signs that women are ready and trying to find um, opportunities and resources. And it's, it just makes sense that the government mm -hmm. would do their duty and uh, enable those women. So just, um, I think it's more of an exaggeration of the situation. We have seen uh, before when the government uh, allowed women into the sport, for instance, the Olympics, or when the government allowed more women in the uh, advisory council, the royal advisory council, or when they, the government allowed more women in um, municipal election. 
um, no resistance, actually insignificant resistance arise, and they are not um, really, um, they were insignificant to the decision of the political will. Hala Dosri, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Former Israeli President Shimon Peres has died at a hospital near Tel Aviv two weeks after suffering a stroke. He was 93. In today's picture of this, we look back at his life and his controversial political career. World leaders will be gathering in Israel on Friday for the funeral of Shimon Peres, and on Friday's program, we'll be debating his legacy. But for now, thanks for watching this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Bye bye.